Well, we are in part two now of our series, The Meaning of Life, a study in Ecclesiastes. And last week I introduced the series with a subtitled message, Under the Sun. But I think the greatest impact that I had was through my chocolate bunny story. It's all I heard about. That's all I heard about. Even in Wednesday of last week, I actually received anonymously a pure chocolate solid bunny. Yeah, yeah. So what I've learned about that is that this week I'm going to preach about ribeye steaks. It's going to have nothing to do with the message, but there you go. Amen. Anyway, other than the bunny, we talked about the emptiness of living our lives focused on ourselves, focused on our own accomplishments and goals without any consideration of God or his word. See, when we live our lives completely focused on activities or things that are under the sun, which was what our title was last week, see, we fail to acknowledge the God who is above it. The only way to experience true meaning and purpose in this life is to live it, all of it, to the glory of his name. Come on, Christ in us, the hope of glory. Now, you see, the thing is, it may be the same work that we do. I think sometimes we think uh, some people come into a church and they're like, if I give my heart to the Lord, if I really get serious about God, I'm going to end up in Africa or in the deepest jungles of South America. It doesn't work that way. Now, if you do, it's because God put that passion and gifting in your heart to do it and you will be blessed. I got one amen. (laughs) But it doesn't work that way. See, God has gifted each of us with certain things that we do well, that we're passionate about, that we're good at, and he places us where he wants to place us in society. It may be the same work. It's not really as much about what I'm doing as why I'm doing it. If it's to build my own name, if it's to build my own reputation, Or is it to honor God and give him glory? See, if we work and strive to build our own name and we we see that all around us, right? There is a level of glory that comes with that. But it's a glory that will fade away. It's a glory that will not last. And so that when we look back on our life, if we've lived it that way, we're going to look back on it and it's going to feel very empty, hollow, and meaningless. That is what Solomon is wrestling with. One of my favorite worship leaders, uh, I used to be a worship leader, and so I was one of the, one of the, the guys that I used his music so often was Matt Redman. And he wrote one of the best worship songs of all time, sung around the world, called Heart of Worship. Well, in his earlier years, he was at a church as a worship pastor, and they started getting a name for themselves, for himself and for the band and all of this stuff. And the pastor started to get an uneasy feeling in his spirit. He started realizing that this this band and this young worship leader was getting a little too big for his britches. And he sat the whole team down. He sat them down. And they didn't even have regular worship for weeks. And during that period of painful time for Matt, God, God got a hold of him. And he wrote... When the music fades, that was his life. He had, he had identified his whole life with music. When the music fades and all is stripped away and I simply come longing just to bring something that's of worth that will bless his heart. I'm coming back to the heart of worship 
It's all about you, Jesus. That's what I'm talking about. That's what I'm talking about. True meaning comes through a life well lived to the glory of God. So today my task is really difficult because we only have really two more weeks and 11 more chapters. Now I know how I'm going to end the series in chapter 12. So today I'll be preaching the others in the, for the next three and a half hours. So just get ready. No, I actually think I'm going to extend the series <laughs> at least one week. Um, but I want to subtitle our message today, Seasons. Everybody say Seasons. Seasons. Father, thank you for your presence and your anointing during the worship. Lord, thank you as Nate read your word that you are the great high priest. That you are able to mediate between God and man. That you gave your own blood. No longer the, 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 the blood of goats and calves are needed, Lord, but your own blood once and for all time was shed for the sins of the world. And we celebrate that. We thank you for that today. So right now, would you, by your spirit, cause your word to become alive? Let it be rhema to our soul today. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. Seasons. Seasons. We are changing in the middle of a transition from summer to fall. Is anybody else as excited about that as me? We got a little glimpse and taste. We've had a little chill in the air in the mornings. Oh my word, I am excited. Fall is my favorite season. Who's with me? Anybody? A lot of you. Fall is my favorite. It's just got, it's got all the stuff. It's got all the things, right? Football. Enough said? Is that enough? <laughs> but all of the, the, the warm and fuzzies and the, you know, just, just the, the weather's wonderful. And, and, you, and, and my favorite holiday, Thanksgiving. Come on, Thanksgiving is the best. It's the best, y'all, because you don't have to worry about all the gifts. You just get together and you just eat. Hallelujah. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. It's wonderful. <laughs> One of my favorite things about living in North Georgia is that to some degree, we get to experience all four seasons and fall and spring being the best, winter being the worst. This is not my opinion, by the way, this is scientific. <laughs> and then summer is just a great reminder of the blood of Jesus because it's as hot as, <laughs> you don't want to go there, the blood, see? It's logic. It's just logic. <laughs> the point is that seasons come and go. They change. Some we like, some we don't, some we tolerate, some we don't want to end. Pastor, are you still talking about the weather? <laughs> I don't know. But Solomon talks a lot in Ecclesiastes about seasons, and I know he isn't talking about the weather. So let's take a look. We're going to use a very famous text. You may not even have realized if you're new to church and new to the Bible, you may not have even realized this was in the Bible. You've heard it in song lyrics. And this is a very famous passage. So let's look at Ecclesiastes 3. We're going to begin with verse 1. It's a little different because we're going to be in the New Living Translation, but you will recognize it. Now, verse 1 says, for everything there is a a time for every activity under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to harvest, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to tear down and a time to build up, a time to cry and a time to laugh, a time to grieve and a time to dance, a time to scatter stones and a time to gather stones, a time to embrace and a time to turn away. A time to search and a time to quit searching. A time to keep and a time to throw away. I highlighted that because some of you are hoarders. <laughs> and this is a freeing word by the Holy Spirit today. It's okay, sir, that you throw that little two by four away in your garage that keeps tripping you up every time you try to get your lawnmower. You're not going to use it. Just throw it away. Some of you are much worse than that. If you haven't worn it in the last two years, give it away. 
All right, I'll move on. A time to tear down and a time to mend, a time to be quiet and a time to speak. A time to be, that will preach. I could have preached the whole message on that one phrase. We could save ourselves a lot of heartache, pain, awkwardness, suffering if we would just listen to Solomon and realize we don't have to respond every single time. You don't have to post about it every single time. You don't have to text back every single time. You don't have to respond every time or have your opinion. It's really okay. <laughs> there is a time to be quiet and there is a time to speak. Verse eight, a time to love and a time to hate. When is it ever appropriate for a Christian to hate? Is Solomon off his rocker here? What's, what's, I mean, Jesus, Matthew five, the, 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 uh, the sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, you have heard the law that says, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you in that way, by loving those that are unlovable, by loving people that nobody else loves. In that way, you will be acting as true children of your father in heaven. So according to Jesus himself, we shouldn't even hate our enemies. We shouldn't even, even hate those that are, we would consider monsters and that cause uh, evil and, and chaos in the world and suffering. So when is it ever appropriate for a believer to hate. All right, I've got a fairly lengthy point here. This is the long, as longest as I've ever done, I think, on the screen, but I, I want to make the point. Every human has been made in the image of God, so we should never hate a person. I didn't say it was easy, it's just scripture. But we are obligated to hate their sin if it causes pain and suffering to the innocent. You've heard it said like this. You don't hate the person, you hate the, the sin. But it goes further. We are to hate evil. Especially evil that causes suffering to the innocent. But listen, this is not on the screen. I added it later in my notes. If you have hate in your heart for a person, and you may have been hurt deeply, by this person, maybe abused by this person. If you hold on to hate for that person, it will suck the joy out of your life and it will hurt you far more than hurting them. And through Christ and his strength and his redeeming love, we can forgive. We can release that. You didn't mean you allowed them back into your life doesn't mean you allow them access to your life or to your family, but you can release them by forgiving them in Jesus' name and be set free Amen. of that in your heart. Amen. Verse nine, what do people really get? This is back to Solomon. What do people really get for all their hard work? I have seen the burden God has placed on us all. What's he talking about there? What does he mean by the burden? that God has placed on all of us. The best rendering for the Hebrew language, the original text here for the word burden is affliction. Affliction. Now, what's he talking? It goes back to Genesis chapter three when God is judging sin and he curses the earth and he curses the devil and he puts judgment on the man and the woman because of their sin. And sometimes I think we forget about Genesis chapter three. I think we forget that, especially in our first world American context, we're mostly, we're pretty comfortable. We forget that God cursed this planet we call earth because of sin. Now Jesus broke the curse of sin and death through his work on the cross and his resurrection. But listen, listen, we still live in a fallen, sin-sick world. We still live every day of our lives behind enemy lines where bad things do happen to good people. 
What are you saying, pastor? What point are you trying to make? I'm saying, listen to me, it's a huge mistake to live with this expectation that this life is going to be somehow perfect and that if I'm a Christian, God won't allow me to go through a level of pain and suffering. Look at the screen. We don't have faith so that we can avoid the trials of life. We have faith so that we can overcome them. Come on, Jesus said in John 16, 33, you will have trouble. But then he says, take heart. He says, in this world, my brothers, my sisters, you will, not you might, you may, you will have trouble. Can anybody say amen? amen. You will have trouble, but take heart because I have overcome the world. So if Christ is living his life through you, we are made more than conquerors through his name. It doesn't mean we're going to bypass or go over the trouble. It means that we are made more than conquerors. We're made able to go through it in Jesus name. Church, I want to encourage you take heart. There is coming a day when this present darkness that we live in will be pierced by the wonderful and marvelous light of Jesus Christ when he comes again. There is coming a day when he will make all things new, a new heaven and a new earth. He will restore and he will reclaim what the enemy has stolen and what sin has destroyed. In Revelation 21, it says, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth have passed away and, and, and there is no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God. God prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things have passed away. He who was seated on the throne, who is that? Jesus, Jesus. Jesus said, I am making all things new. Now give him the best praise. Anybody looking forward? <laughs> Folks, this life is not the end. Amen. These struggles, these difficulties, this pain in our body, this pain in our relate, these things are not the end. This life is not the sum total of our experience. It's just, scripture says, a vapor, a mist compared to the eternity that we will spend either with God or without him. It goes back to what I taught last week. Don't put all your hope and focus and strength into things under the sun. Don't forget that the true meaning of life comes from our God who is above it. <laughs> and that same God, say same God. Same. Come on, the same God that is the God of the universe, the creator of our world. He has chosen to dwell in you. <laughs> That's crazy. But it's true and it's wonderful. Let's finish. Verse 10, again, we've already read this, but I want to remind you. It says, I have seen the burden or the affliction God has placed on us all. Verse 11, yet God has made everything beautiful. Say beautiful. God has made everything beautiful for its own time, its own season. One of my favorite old choruses from the late 70s, early 80s. And I actually know the author. He was my choir director at Lee, Dr. David Horton. He wrote a song called Something Beautiful. You Mount Paranites have heard Dr. Walker sing that. The lyrics are on the screen. It says, something beautiful, something good. All my confusion, come on, 
he understood. All I had to offer him was brokenness and strife, but he made something beautiful out of my life. Something beautiful, something good. All my confusion, he understood. All I had to offer him was brokenness and strife. But he made something beautiful out of my life. Isn't that wonderful? Here's the point. God can bring redemption out of the worst dysfunction. Let that just rest in your soul. God can bring redemption out of the worst. Come on, from cover to cover. From Genesis to Revelation, story after story after story of God making something beautiful out of the darkest seasons of human existence. That's what he does. That's who he is. My God is able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all that we could ever ask, think, or even imagine. My God is able. One example, just one example, Jacob, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, a mess. The most dysfunctional family you have ever read about. Go to Genesis, read the story if you haven't, it will encourage you about your family. Be like, dear God. And out of this dysfunction came 12 sons that became the 12 tribes of Israel. And out of the dysfunction of the country and the nation of Israel, one day God would bring on the scene the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, our Messiah, Jesus Christ. God can do anything. And he makes it beautiful in his time, in his season. Mm. Let me encourage you. You may be in a season of dysfunction right now. It might be a relational thing. It might be a financial thing. You may be in a season of confusion where you don't know what to do. You don't know which way to turn. You don't know the decision to make. You may be in a season of sorrow, loss, pain, but just like the summer is changing into fall, your season will also change. And if you let him, God will restore. God will redeem what you've lost. And he can make something beautiful out of your life. The last part of verse 11 says, God has planted eternity in the human heart. But even so, people cannot see the whole scope of God's work from beginning to end. Folks, no matter how much we study, which we should, how much we pray, we're, we're finite beings. We cannot comprehend everything that he's doing in the earth. But God has put eternity in our heart. What does that mean? God has put eternity. It means that he's given us a longing, a longing for the eternal. He's given us a longing for the things that only he can do in our life. Even the unbeliever out there has it. They just don't know what to call it. They don't know what it is. And so they try to fill that void with everything under the sun. Come on, somebody. They try to fill it with alcohol, drugs, sex, work, family, whatever it is. We can't even fill that void with those that we love the most in this earth. If we try, it's a mistake. If we try, it will fall short. The only thing that can fill the void in our heart is Jesus himself and the eternal promises that he gives us in his word. My God, I believe that that. Yeah. 
It's a longing to be in step with his timing. And the seasons he has and the purposes that he has. See, if we reject God's timing, listen, listen, please. Our best intentions will fall flat. If we run ahead of God or if we ignore his prompting, even the purest of our works will feel empty. It's only when we fully yield to the Holy Spirit, fully yield to his plan, his timing, his purposes that our works have meaning and produce fruit. John 15 and five, Jesus said, I am the vine. You are the branches. I'm the source of life, not you. If you will remain in me, if you will stay in step with me, if you will stay attached to me and I in you, then you will bear much fruit. But apart from me, you can do nothing. So Solomon's wisdom rings so true, even in 2022, for everything there is a season. Our problem (laughs) so often is timing. Timing. Why, Pastor? Because we don't have any patience. (laughs) Am I the only one? But when our timing is out of sync with God's timing, even if it's a good thing, even if it's a good work, it could prove disastrous and even dangerous. Look at the screen. Contentment is found in God's time and from his hand. And we can substitute the word meaning. Meaning is found in God's time and from his purpose is found. How about, how about this one? Peace is found in God's, in being a part and in sync with God's seasons and God's time. Let me give you an example. What God has given me personally, and I'll say blessed me with at 48 years of age, would have been a disaster if he had given me the same thing when I was 28. What is a blessing now would have been a curse then. And what he has for me when I'm 68, well, maybe I can't handle that right now. And I've got to be okay with that. And I've got to trust him because he is a good father and has my best interest at heart. My God, that is maturity. If we will come to that place, what a blessing it is if we can come to that place of trust and faith in our God. I feel the spirit. Trust me, it wasn't always that way. There's been plenty of times, probably when I was about 28, that I tried to manufacture his will. And when older, mature, more mature people came along and guess what I did? I played the God card. Oh, but it's the Lord's will. I played the God. You know what happens when somebody comes to me in counseling and their life is a mess and they tell me what they want to do and I'm like, in my spirit, I'm going, oh my Lord, don't do that. And they, oh no, no, this is what God wants me to do. There's nothing I can say to that. Be careful about playing the God card unless you have truly heard from God. And guess what? It has to line up with this because this is his authoritative word. I've kicked down doors that he closed and every time I paid the price. And unfortunately, my family paid the price. Because it's not just us, is it? 
When Jesus first comes on the scene in the gospels, he repeatedly said, and if you study the Bible, you know this, he repeatedly said things like, my time has not yet come. We can learn a lot about timing from what isn't written about Jesus. We only get one glimpse of his childhood when he's 12 years old, when Mary and Joseph lose him in Jerusalem, right? And then we don't hear anything else until he's 30. The son of the living God didn't really begin until he was 30. The point is this, we can't neglect the process. We can't neglect the process of spiritual formation. We can't neglect the process of growth and maturity. We can't afford to jump ahead of God's timing. You know, almost every time when we hear about a big name, young pastor preacher falling in, mor in immorality, how many of you talk about, just you hear about it a lot. You hear about it almost every, or I'd say every single time it's because he was promoted too soon. He was promoted based on his ability, his gifting, his talent to get up and do what I'm doing right now better than anybody else. So they shove him up there and it fills the seats until Satan takes him out because there's no character. Talent should never be the measuring stick for promotion. It should always be about character first. And that goes for anything in this world. If you own a business and you're over people and you've got a gifted young person that, is, that can just do it all, be careful about promoting too quickly. They may be better at it than you are, but you've got something they don't and that's years of experience. Don't neglect the process. Students, Young adults, 30-somethings, listen to your pastor, please. There is a season for promotion. There is a season of influence and leadership. But you can't bypass the season of learning. You can't bypass the season of growth and apprenticeship, formation, that's just old fashioned wisdom, isn't it? Can I remind you that the book that we're reading, Ecclesiastes is a book of wisdom. As Solomon gets in our face, he offends us with some of these thoughts, but that's what it is. Solomon lets us know that wisdom, listen, doesn't come to us in a neat little package. It comes through joy and pain. It comes through success and failure. It comes through exciting times and it comes through the mundane seasons. Wisdom comes over decades of building relationships, first with God and then those he brings into our lives. And I'll finish with this. God wants us to enjoy our lives. Uh, I got two amens. Do you want to enjoy your life? God wants us to enjoy our lives. That's not his primary purpose, but he does. It's all through the Bible. He wants us to enjoy our family. He wants us to enjoy our friends. He wants us to enjoy food, thank the Lord. Thank you. I, I've, I've got that one down. Tonight, seven o'clock, he wants us to enjoy one another. He wants us to enjoy and celebrate with 12 people who are getting baptized. He wants us to enjoy. He wants us to find fulfillment in our work. Boy, that's all through Ecclesiastes. Anybody done any extra reading? It's all through there that he wants us to enjoy what we put our hands to. But never forget the big idea. 
work and play and life apart from God are meaningless. See, God, because of Jesus, has given us a better way than this world offers. Right? It's a blessed way. The way of the the sinner, the way of the person that's away from God is, is hard. It's cursed. God has given us a blessed way, a more abundant way. He's given us a full life with every kind of season that we can imagine. Would you bow your heads, please?